What's going on, everybody? We are back. This is episode 144 of the Dark Windows podcast. My name is Kevin. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm Kevin. So in recent weeks, um, on the show and on our Facebook eating challenge, we've kind of dumped on French Canadians pretty hard. So I, I figured, fuck it, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, we are going to talk about a man that we've kind of talked about in passing on an episode that you did with the strange New England area, uh, strange things in New England, we're going to talk about Joseph LePage. So Joseph LePage was born Joseph Paget in uh, about 50 miles north of Montreal in 1837. And the first 20 years of his life were kind of a mystery. Not really a lot's known there. Record keeping was not great in the 1800s, as we've mentioned before. Uh, especially in the wilds of Canada at the time, where I'm pretty sure they had a wolf as a mayor or some shit. Possibly polar bear. Never know. You know fucking town it, council it, member all moose. A <laughs> uh, <laughs> couple wolverines, you know, never yeah. know. And lumberjacks. Fucking lumberjacks as far as the eye can see. What we do know is that when he was in his early 20s, he married a woman who was four years older than him by the last name of Roos which is R-O-U-S-S-E. Uh, um, Roos, Rouse, I'm not sure how to pronounce. I'm going to go with Rouse, I think. It seems to R- make more sense. What, what was it? R-O-U-S-S-E. Rouse. Yeah. And uh, shortly after they were married, they started puking out kids. They had five kids within six years. Um, and then they moved the family to St. Beatrice, which is uh, another small town. He gained a reputation for being an abusive piece of shit towards his wife and children. Um, He was a woodsman, so he generally spent his days in the woods cutting down and processing trees and then would go home and proceed to beat the living crap out of his family. Pretty boilerplate stuff for the time, you know. Sweet. And nobody said a word because, you know, of course, your house, your rules. Yeah, it's like 1850 at this point. So it's like it's, you know, commonplace. Just go home and smack your kids around. Yep. Pretty regular shit. Nobody's so gonna things say a to word. what's that? Nobody's going to say a word. No, no, not a chance. Things took a turn in June of 1871 at around 7 a.m. A girl named Julianne went to milk the cows on the La Jeunesse farm as part of her regular morning duties. She walked down the hill out of sight of the house, bucket in hand towards the cows. As she walks through the fields, she stopped when she saw someone step out from behind a nearby tree. He was wearing a red flannel shirt, loose linen pants, with a leather belt, um, a black slouch hat, which I had to look up because I wasn't sure if it was one of those like hipster douchebag, like winter hats, which they call slouch hats, but it wasn't. This is just like a, a wide brimmed hat. Um, closer to like an Amish hat, you know? Okay. Um, it was made of felt. So it was kind of floppy, you know, here and there. Okay. And worst of all, a mask covering his entire face made from Buffalo skin. Hey there, little red riding hood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I automatically, <laughs> I automatically went to, uh, would you fuck me? I'd fuck me so good. Uh, <laughs> 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 fucking French Canadian Buffalo Bill. It puts the lotion on the skin. It puts the lotion on the skin or else it uh, gets a hose again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when he fully emerged from behind the tree, he had a two and a half foot long hardwood club in his hands. <laughs> Not what I was thinking. I guess you just, I was like, he's French Canadian. So, it ain't that big. <laughs> uh, okay. So she saw it and screamed. And uh, as she screamed, he just bolts towards her. Uh-huh. She turns, she turned and ran. Um, he gave chase with his hat flying off. He grabbed her by the arm and spun her around. As she turns, she reaches up and grabs the mask and yanks it off. And she says, quote, I knew him very well. He was my brother-in-law. So uh, Julianne was actually Joseph LePage's 13-year-old sister-in-law. 
Yeah, so he grabbed her by the throat, pinned her to the ground. As she struggled and screamed, he grabbed a fistful of dirt and soil, ground it into her eyes, nose, and mouth to quiet her down. Well, he proceeded to rape her. When he finished the deed, he vanished back into the forest, assumedly going back to work at the lumber camp. And Julianne staggered back to the farm and told uh, Joseph Lajeunesse, who was the owner of the farm, uh, what had happened. Yeah. He brought her into town to talk to whatever counted as a police officer at the time. And uh, and, a, and an arrest warrant was issued for Joseph LePage. Julianne was damaged both physically and mentally from the attack, obviously. Uh, it took over a month for her to be able to eat, drink, and sleep well. So he fucked her up. Unfortunately, LePage had a chance to gather his family and take off for the United States. Where the fuck was the goddamn husband in this situation? She was 13 years old. You weren't married oh, yet. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, okay. Well, in the United States, she'd be. <laughs> What's that? In the U.S., she would be. <laughs> Well, I'm surprised she wasn't in Canada, honestly. I mean, for the time period. Yeah. So he, he falls off the radar for about three years. Um, considering where he came from and where he would end up, I think it's safe to say he bounced around northern New York and New England. Uh, sadly, his past would come back on Friday, July 27th of 1874. Marietta Ball was closing up the small single uh, single room schoolhouse in St. Albans, Vermont, two hours north of where we record. You take Route 7 to Burlington, you take 89, you go for a while and fucking eventually you end up in St. Albans where, I mean, you can buy drugs there. That's about all they've got going on. I think they have a Dick Sporting Goods and they have an archery shop. Yeah. But that's yeah. about it. So she locked up and starts walking to her home on the south end of town. She'd never make it home. With people around town concerned that no one had seen her for the, the following day, search party set out looking for her. She apparently wasn't the kind of person to just like up and disappear or just, you know, not show up to work because she had one of the more important jobs in, in a small town being a school teacher. So she wasn't really just going to flake on that and take off. After almost two days of searching, the parties would find Marietta's nude body in the woods. And here's a quote. She was hideously violated and mangled in the most fiendish manner, says Dr. H.H. H. Farnsworth, who was the local coroner um, in the area. So St. Albans and kind of the, the surrounding area up there. Obviously, it wasn't a place that was real built up at the time. Um, St. Albans was probably the biggest town in the area. And uh, it's still not really like a highly populated area up there. No, definitely. I mean, what, when was this again? Uh, this sorry. was 1874. Okay. So this was after our, what they would call uh, our um, portion of the civil war that happened. Here, <laughs> supposedly. Yeah. So after almost two days of searching, the parties would find Marietta's nude body in the woods. And this is a quote from Dr. H.H. H. Farnsworth, who is a local coroner. He says, quote, she was hideously violated and mangled in the most fiendish manner. She had been stretched out and left laying in the and left laying in the little gully co uh, covered over with leaf litter. Uh, her head had been smashed in with a large rock and she had been raped. It's impossible to say for certain whether she had been raped pre or post mortem. End quote. Gross. Ew. Yeah. So the town goes. Oh, what's that? I said. Ew. Yeah. So the town goes into an absolute rage about this whole thing, and they start pooling resources together to bring in a detective from Boston to try to uh, try to hunt down the men or men, man or men responsible for uh for her death the detective arrived and started interviewing ball's neighbors <laughs> the butthole and penis <laughs> uh, anyway this is serious god damn it i shouldn't be making jokes like that uh one of the kids made an interesting statement though the student said that a man with quote 
deep scratches and bruises on his face had uh, had been asking about Marietta's route home. A man matching this description had been uh, seen around St. Albans in the weeks following Ball's murder, and he was living in the uh, the French settlement and going by the name of Joseph LePage. LePage was arrested immediately, but slipped away due to some uh, some witness testimony that would turn out to be false. The witness actually said that they'd been working together in the hay fields at the time of the murder. So I'm assuming it was a buddy of his, and he's like, hey, man, I fucked up. I need you to cover for me. Uh-huh. Um, so he did. The man also said that the scratches on his face were from picking berries. Uh, following his release, he went home and immediately packed up the family and shipped off again. So they would end up landing in Pembroke, New Hampshire, which is right outside of Concord, which is the capital of the state, um, which is about, I don't know, two and a half, three hours from here, somewhere in that neighborhood. Some, about two hours. Yeah. Ish, yeah. Uh, so towards the tail end of September of 1875, Less than six months after the LePage clan showed up in Pembroke, people in town started noticing a creep lurking on the side of the road leading towards the high school. Um, I kind of feel like this guy's like default movement setting was lurking. You know, he's just kind of yeah. he just lurks. There's no way he doesn't. He moves strangely. He's a creep. Probably got his head hunched down next to his shoulders. And his hands out like a little fucking rat person. <laughs> <sighs> Children. <laughs> He said like children. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, and he's probably Fucking like freak. Like, yeah. 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 Fucking grunting like some goddamn golem motherfucker. Yeah. Um one report from a boy named Clarence Cochran, which I mean that that fucking kid needs to be playing like first base for a Red Sox affiliate. That's no, a name. No, no. Clarence Cochran, he he's he's definitely a lawyer. Either or. (laughs) (laughs) So he says, quote, I saw a man jump out of the bushes on the left side of the road about 50 feet ahead of me. I thought it was my classmate, John Colby, who was a practical joker who liked to scare our classmates. I shouted, get out of here, you long legged son of a gun. You can't scare me. And I don't uh, think he said that. I think he said, you son of a bitch. I don't know, dude. He was a kid back then. I mean, you probably would have got your mouth washed out with a. I don't know, some pretty Come harsh on, soap or something. You... Listen, he pro- like I said, he probably said that, but then he went in and said, you know, you son of a gun. Yeah. He didn't of actually course they got t- that, say. They got that fucking New Hampshire accent, you know. Get out of here, you long-legged son of a gun. Yeah, it's, it's like it's, a cross It's almost between... Boston. It's Boston, Maine. It's, hillb- it's hillbilly Boston. Well, <laughs> Like the further north you go, it's kind of like a main accent. You right. can't get that from here. But then we also get that like half ass chowder accent on the east half of the state here. For people that have interbred with New Hampshire people, you know, and they're just like, <laughs> they've developed their own. Uh huh. But then somehow you got like fucking Richmond, Bristol, and Benson, which are not that close to each other, and they all have the same hillbilly ass accent. Walk in, you're right, bud. We going down Crick Road, do some birdies, burn, burn cruising. Yep, fucking, you know, we we personally know who we're talking about with people like that. We are those people. We don't talk like that though, not in public. <laughs> <laughs> not in public, in private. <laughs> so, so uh, Clarence would race ahead to try to find his friend, but by the time he got there. The figure had jumped back into the brush and there was nobody there. So this guy just vanished like some kind of a fucking French Canadian phantom. Just whoop, gone. <laughs> Woo. And the for next, my next act. <laughs> yeah. I'll be here all week. Try the dead children. Yep. Um, the the next day, this is a fucking name right here. Right here. Right here. Albericia Will, uh, Watson. Albericia Watson again. That's me. <laughs> and her totally and her great. daughter Alice, which is a real name. I've heard Alice before. True, I have. Uh, so Alice was a, a student at the high school. They were walking down the same stretch of road where Clarence's encounter had happened. 
and they kind of sense somebody behind them. Like, you know, you, you get that feeling like, you know, somebody's watching you. So you yeah, kind of like yeah. turn and look over your shoulder and you're like, oh, fuck, there is somebody there. OK, it's that little like sixth sense, spidey sense. Yeah. You know? So they both turn and they notice a man standing about 100 feet behind him in the shadows of the tree line holding a big fucking stick or a club in his right hand. The mother and daughter turn and continue down the road and the man steps out of the trees and starts following them at an increasing pace. So he's starting to like, you know, wheels are starting to go. He's, uh-huh. he's, he's winding up. So they start to panic obviously, because there's a fucking crazy person chasing them with a stick and they broke into a run. Uh, just as they heard him start running up the road behind them. So he had already started running and they heard this and they're like, Oh, we got to go. And they, they took off. So they come around the corner and they stop, uh, they spot George Mack, who was one of their uh, one of their neighbors down the road. He was uh, he's out picking uh, berries, and uh, Alberisa pushes her daughter towards him, and then looks over his shoulder, and their pursuer is gone. He just kind of like peeled off back into the woods. Th- th- this reminds me of a fucking Bigfoot encounter, you know, like you're getting chased down some logging road, and you look back, and it's just like full pace, just whoosh, right yep. off into the woods, doesn't even break yep. stride. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. What if this guy is Bigfoot? Hmm. That would lead to a different question: Are all Bigfoot French Canadians, or all French Canadians Bigfoot? No, no, no fucking way. No, I don't no. know. The same weekend, Hiram and Harriet Towel. Uh, oh, Paul, I love that name, Hiram. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know That's why. A, I don't know. God. That's Hank. That's Hank Williams Sr.'s actual first name. No way. Was it is? Yep. Huh. Um. <clears throat> so, so they were in their so juniors. Actual first name is Hiram too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe he legally changed it to Hank though, because he's like fucking Hank Williams. I mean, so the the uh, the couple towel uh, toll whatever are traveling in their buggy when they notice a man step out of the, of the woods right next to their, their cart with a fucking club in his hand again, they thought they had maybe sighted another man that I think should be covered at some point in time on the show. I think we, we could probably nail him down. Uh, Franklin Evans, who earned the nickname, the Northwoods monster oh. for doing some other atrocious shit in the area. His name popped up and I was like, wait a minute, who's this? And I did like a little bit, a little bit of looking and I was like, Okay. <clears throat> I see you. <laughs> We're coming for you, motherfucker. Um, hey, so LePage, hey, hey. <laughs> LePage is having a busy few days. Not only had he been super weird to the Towels family in their wagon, so he locked in on another target. This time it would be 16-year-old Lydia Fowler. We're going with Lydia. Like, we'd already cut the conversation, but she's got a weird fucking name, so we're going with Lydia. <laughs> All on right. September 22nd, LePage was out threshing rye on the Fowler farm, notices Lydia again as she's walking across the front yard, and he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm going to get me some of that teenage ass, fucking yeah. pig. So he starts asking about her to one of the men that he's working with. He's like, uh, he's asking stuff like, where she go to school? Uh, what kind, Who does she have for friends? What kind of route does she take to get there? So the guy he's talking to is her brother. <laughs> But due to the time period and the fact that LePage was older than him, he didn't, uh, you you didn't talk back to your elders. You didn't disrespect him because your parents, your parents would give them permission to beat the shit out of you. And this guy probably would have eaten him or something. Um, So he, he just answered, he answered all the questions, you know? So some of the people that have, have done a lot of research into this say that LePage was most likely planning to attack Lydia October 4th of 1875 on our way to school. But by the time he got in place and had his club and I'm sure had just a raging murder boner going, he had completely missed Lydia and her, uh, her, and her, and her friend, Sarah Preetness. Josie Langmaid didn't have the same luck. And I think right here is going to be where we're going to take our break and we'll come back and talk about one of the more brutal murders we've talked about in recent memory. Okay, we are back. Josie Langmaid is two months away from turning 18 years old, and she was one of the 
one of the pretty like popular girls in school mm-hmm. which i mean when you got like 20 fucking people in school whatever <laughs> somebody's got to be the pretty popular girl was she a bitch who knows either way she, she either way she did not deserve what she was about to get so she she usually made the two and a half mile trek to school with her younger brother waldo which two and a i mean half <laughs> miles yeah yeah down a fucking <sighs> dirt ass road with a kid named waldo wow constantly trying to find the little prick hiding with a striped shirt and stuff motherfucker and his dumb gloves Son of a bitch. but on the day in question she sent him along to school on his own because she was waiting for a friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the school, how the school worked is you had, you had reminder bells that would ring before school started. Yep. So the first, the first reminder bell rings at about nine Oh five. So they, you know, they're getting down to nine 15 for class time. So when the first school bell rings and her friend hasn't show, shown up yet, she takes off in a hurry. And about five minutes later at about nine 10, she passes uh, Bernard Guile, who would be the last person to see her alive other than Joseph LePage. Waldo returned from school and told his mother that Josie had never shown up, uh, which was not like her at all. She was a, a really good student. She was a smart kid. She wasn't going to... This is like before the time where you're going to flake on school and like go smoke cigarettes in the parking lot with your friends or something. Yeah. You didn't do that shit because you'd, you'd no. catch a fucking beating when you got home. Exactly. So as any worried mother would, Mrs. Langmaid went out uh, to all the neighbors' houses to see if Josie had, uh, I don't know, she'd maybe gotten sick on the way to school, gotten hurt, and she was just staying with somebody else until she could get back on her feet. But the only person that had seen her all day was Bernard Guile. Within an hour or so of her not showing back up from school, word had gotten out that uh, something wasn't quite right. And then groups of men start combing the forest and uh, surrounding area, trying to find her. Uh, so these guys are out there by torchlight with dogs and, and shotguns and shit looking for this girl. And at about eight o'clock that night, uh, Daniel Merrill, a local farmer literally stumbled across her in a marshy area, about 80 feet off the side of the road. Oh boy. She was described as such by the coroner. She was laying on her back with her right arm doubled underneath and her left arm was across her breast. So she had one arm tucked back underneath her and her left arm across her chest. The right foot was drawn up. The clothes appeared to have been removed and thrown back, all saturated with blood. Her breasts were bare. Oh, God, I don't like that I have to say this. (laughs) Her vulva had been cut away and carried off by the butcher, never to be found. This was, a, again, this was a direct quote from the coroner who was brought to the scene. Uh, the following morning, <clears throat> another man who remained anonymous because I'm sure that he probably didn't want to be connected to what he's about to come across, makes another absolutely grisly discovery in the woods. Uh, it was a secondary search party that had gone out the next day trying to find any kind of clues as to try to find any kind of clues as to if anybody had left anything or um, was still in the area. Yep. Um, so this guy would come around the side of a tree and he would find Josie's head that had been removed from the scene and wrapped in a blue cloth apron laying at the base of the tree. The coroner said after examining the newly found head that her head had been, quote, crushed with a club or a large rock and her face had been stomped in, leaving a very visible boot print on one cheek. She was then decapitated with an axe. Oh, so she did have some defensive wounds, uh, including every bone in her left hand and lower forearm being broken and shattered as she was trying to defend herself from whatever she's being hit with. Yeah. And the initial suspicion fell to uh, William Drew, who was a local stonemason. The suspicion mostly came from this came from when uh, from a local that had said something to the effect of, quote, repeated improper advances towards schoolgirls, even though he was married with children. Yeah. So we don't have the market cornered on scumbags in the 21st century. They've always existed, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Uh 
so after questioning others in the area, a, a, a pretty solid story had come forward from, from witnesses and people that were working with him that Drew had been fixing a stone fence at the time of the murder. He had been there all day. He got there at seven o'clock and he left at like four o'clock in the afternoon. So he'd yeah. been there all day working on this, this wall. Days later, um, the story had actually spread to the surrounding area. And Dr. Farnsworth, our coroner in St. Albans, had gotten you know wind of the story. And when he heard the details about the killing of Langmaid, he noticed a lot of similarities between her death and the attack and resulting death of Marietta Ball. Due to his recollection of one of the suspects in the Ball murder that resulted in the suspect leaving the area immediately and moving to where he was now, Pembroke officials convened with Farnsworth and he's like, Hey, this is what the guy looked like. And he left town pretty quickly after like within a few weeks after uh, her murder. And they're like, Hey, we got a guy here that looks like that too. So they pay our buddy, Joseph LePage a visit at home. They, uh, they, they essentially pull him out of his house. Um, I hope they beat the living shit out of him when they did. Um, Your ass is coming with us. Yeah. So while they're holding him outside, they turn his house upside down. They end up finding a bloody overcoat, a bloodstained hat, and a pair of trousers that were, quote, bespattered with blood from the belt line all the way down to the ankle cuffs. Needless to say, LePage was uh, was arrested, and uh, he stuck to a story that he had been, quote, lost in the woods at the time of the, the attack. Whatever. Yeah, you ain't lost in the woods, you piece of shit. Uh, one local girl by the name of Hattie Galt said that she had seen LePage walking down Academy Road, which was the road that led up to the high school, um, uh-huh. with an axe in his hand in the days leading up to it. So he'd been scoping this place out for a little bit. Another witness came forward by the name of Thomas Gardner, who said that the same day that Josie had been reported missing, that LePage visited his and his wife's home. When Mr. Gardner mentioned about Josie being missing, LePage blurted out, quote, it's too bad that girl had been killed. And uh, which they thought was kind of weird and just looked at him. And as soon as the words came out of his mouth, he stood up and left the building. <laughs> like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I screwed up. Well. So after, yeah, after further witness testimony, LePage was officially charged with the rape, mutilation and murder of Josie Langmaid. When they questioned LePage's wife about any connections between the two murders that he was suspected for between Vermont and New Hampshire, she said that she didn't have any damning evidence, but she thought that he was fully capable of committing the crime because she had more than once, quote, foiled his attempts to ravish their own 15-year-old daughter. So, yeah, this guy's a real fucking winner. Big time. Oh, boy. So they're holding this fucking guy in the uh, state prison in Concord. And while he's in there, he takes his bed frame apart and builds tools to try to dig his way out. They they they, they left him on the outside wall of the building. So he had like a, a an exterior wall in his cell. He manages to pry 17 bricks free in the wall before anybody noticed. So he, he'd been a busy boy. You know, yeah. that, so you're, you're chipping through mortar and brick with a metal bed leg, essentially, to try to get out. Yeah. On Tuesday, January 7th of 1876, a massive crowd gathers at the city hall in Concord for his trial. Before the trial started, the jurors that had been selected, so these 12 men, because obviously we don't put women on juries in the 1800s. No, no <laughs> they're no. not people. They can't vote. No nope. property can't vote. Nope. No, so they, they couldn't. Run. No, that's just so the truth, they, and I and and they and they weren't considered his peers. No, they were again essentially property. Yeah, they're for cooking and puking out kids. That's about all they're good for at that point. Yeah. So they they round up these twelve jurors and Joseph LePage, and they put them on a wagon and they take them back to the scene of the murder which I'm pretty sure wouldn't fly nowadays. 
No. Pretty sure that would be like coercing a jury or something like that. You know, whatever. Yeah, well, uh... I, I mean, you didn't have crime scene photos, so you kind of have to get an idea of it somehow. True. True. So the 12 jurors are led into the woods where Josie's headless body had been found. Well, LePage sat on the wagon at shotgun point looking into the woods with absolutely no emotion shown on his face. Just kind of sitting there. Mm, that's okay. I'm not worried about it. I really wish at this point in time the guy holding the, <laughs> holding the shotgun had just slipped and blown his fucking teeth across oh. the across the woods. Did I oh, no. <laughs> Did you hit him with both barrels? I, I must have. It was an accident. Fell on it in the shower. No, I think I only hit him with one. <laughs> well, you better hit him with another one. Yeah, hit him with the other one. Make sure he's dead. This fucking guy. <laughs> so from the murder scene, they're led to where her head had been found. And this is one of the weirdest details about this whole story. Someone in an effort to mark the spot had cut a section of bark out of the tree where her uh-huh. head had been found and written in pencil. Uh, fuck, where was it? Uh, they, they written in pencil, quote, Jay Langmaid's head found here, October 5th, 1875. Poor Josie. May she rest in peace. I was like, okay, <laughs> we, we could have done that a little less clearly, but Hey, whatever. Yeah. Because where they found her body, when they removed her body, they drove, they just drove a stake into the ground and they tied a big section, like a big chunk of black cloth to it. Uh-huh. So that you could find it in the woods. This motherfucker's like, nah, I got it. We're gonna cut a cut a little window in the tree and, and write some shit. <laughs> I know where paper comes from. <laughs> so once they get him in court, his trial lasts about six days. It's you know, five and a half to six and a half days, somewhere in that neighborhood. Wow. One of the more interesting details was from one of the from a surprise witness. They brought forward Julianne Rouse, LePage's steps, uh, LePage's sister-in-law. Uh, she had to use a translator because she only spoke that filthy, filthy language of French. Um, and after telling the jury about her experience five years earlier, they deliberated uh, for a total of ninety minutes before they come back with a guilty verdict. Wow! Obviously, but. The verdict was argued by the defense due to the judge allowing the testimony of Rouse, who had not had any direct connection with the Langmaid case. Nowadays, you could still get that to stick. You could go, okay, we're bringing this woman forward because she had the same thing happen yeah. to her because of this guy. Yeah. It's a, it's a basically a character witness at that point in time. Uh-huh. But... Back then, they're like, nah, we, we we can't get that to stick. Yeah. So he's thrown back in jail. Um, and they set up a second trial for March of 1877. This one was even quicker, lasting about two days. And they deliberated for 30 minutes. And this time, the conviction stuck. He would sit in jail for over a year before he was executed on March 15th, 1878. According well, to an article. Up. Yes. But it's so much better than that. So according to an article from the New York Times, uh, there's a little a blurb here. Quote, he was a perfectly docile prisoner who gave no trouble to the warden or guards. He made no complaint about his treatment, nor asked for anything. What a fucking doll. Aww. What a guy. The Monday before his execution, he was allowed to see his family. But other than some tears from his daughters, like because his daughters were still fairly young, there wasn't really a lot of uh, a lot of emotion shown on either side of the table. Um, they left, uh, kissed his wife goodbye, kissed his daughters goodbye, shook his son's hands, and they just took off. <laughs> that was the last yeah. time they'd see him alive. The night before he would be put to death, the local priest came to visit him, and the the pair prayed in his cell for hours. Um, before the priest left, he asked him to bring the warden back. Uh, LePage would say, you know, asked him, bring the warden back to my cell, please. So he brings the warden back. And as the warden walks in, LePage just kind of drops to his knees and, and broken English confesses to the murder of the two girls that he's responsible for. And then he told the warden that he felt greatly relieved 
great. Good for you. I'm I'm so so sure that the family of these two dead girls are happy that you've made amends and you're relieved. I'm happy for him. Yeah. So the next morning, Joseph LePage was led from his cell after breakfast and another meeting with a priest to receive sacrament to the gallows that had been built in the north wing of the prison. When he arrived, there's a large, big crowd surrounding the platform, and among them is James Langmaid, Josie's father. It, James had been having kind of a rough time. Um, obviously, he lost yeah. his daughter to this piece of shit. Um, and then two months later, after she died, uh, Waldo would actually die of consumption at 13 years old. Uh. So not 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 a good time for James. This, this no. guy's had a had a rough go of it. Uh, a few minutes after 11 a.m., Sheriff Dodge would adjust the noose around LePage's neck, read aloud to the crowd the death warrant that had been issued, put the black hood over LePage's head, and pull the lever to drop the trapdoor from under his feet. Here's another little quote from one of the doctors that was on site. He died with just a small twitch of the legs. The good news for us is that the fall broke his neck but didn't kill him. He died after 20 minutes, hanging paralyzed, and finally suffocated to death. I'm so glad that he was awake for the whole thing. Uh, he, he, didn't get the, he didn't get a quick way out of it. Fuck nope. this guy. <laughs> oh, boy. So he was then buried in the Blossom Hill Cemetery, where two weeks later, a group of teenagers dug his ass up and hung him from the water pipe on the state house yard. He was found the next morning on April Fool's Day. <laughs> Fuck this fucking turd. Yeah. Um, and there's actually, there's a there's still a monument to the memory of Josie Langmaid on Academy Road in Suncook, New Hampshire, that you can go visit. Yep. Um, and that's the one that you spoke of when we talked about the uh, the weird New England areas. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's fucking Joseph LePage. This uh, is a real winner. Glad we talked about him. Oh, what a cunt. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reading it, I was like, why am I doing this? This guy sucks. Yeah. Oh, he's a piece of shit. That's why. So, uh-huh. um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's Joseph LePage. So, oh. and again, I really want to cover that other guy at some point. Cause I think we could, uh, we could have some fun with that one. But anyway, Kevin, why don't you take us out? talking about some of them sexy ass headphones you're wearing yeah if you're in the mood for a pair of headphones earbuds or bluetooth speaker studio is the place to go go over to studio.com check them out they have they have it all um and as of right now they're starting a new campaign uh they are offering the ets for the low price of 129 us 99 GDP, 179 Canadian. Um, and they're also offering a new wireless charger for your devices at really, $49. yes, $49 like what kind of, like to charge your phones and shit, or just for your headphones. Uh, I think it's headphones, I'm not quite sure. I'll check it out, but Damn. uh, it's uh. Uh, forty nine dollars US, thirty nine dollars uh, GDP, and sixty nine Canadian. Uh so yeah, and you can still get fifteen percent off your purchase. Pretty rad. So, with putting in the Dark Windows Pod, uh, f- f- uh Dark Windows fifteen in the the checkout when yes. you uh put the, put in the promo code, and you'll get fifteen percent off your entire purchase. So sure will. This is pretty good, and the Ets are fantastic. You have a pair, don't you? Yes, yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I just read this. I, I apologize. Um, my mistake here. So it's my bad. the The wireless chargers charger is actually good with uh the Et model only. So oh, okay, it will charge your wirelessly charge your Ets. So you guys, you probably can stick them on, you know, little thing and uh, wirelessly charge them, which is pretty nice. It's pretty cool, yeah. I'm almost thinking about getting those myself. Um, 
they do charge fast though. When yeah, you have I mean, them in even, there. even the uh, um, the Neva and the Tolv charge yeah. super fast. Like you can go from dead to fully charged in like thirty minutes. It's it's yep. pretty nice. Yeah. Um, and you get a sure, they're a sure. quality quality head, like earbud. Uh, oh, oh yeah. And it's it's not because they sponsor us, but I literally will never buy another brand of headphones or earbuds ever again because they're that well made, they're that well put together, they're uh-huh. comfortable, and they're not over expensive. I mean, no, nah. you, you get what you pay for, and you you know yeah, you spend a little bit of money, but the only thing I found with them so far, and it's not their fault, they are not dog proof. <laughs> so no, no, definitely I mean, not. But other than that, I mean, they're they're great headphones. But yeah, so yeah, head over, like I said, head over to studio.com, check them out, and find what you want, put in your basket, and put that promo code in of Dark Windows 15 to get 15% off. And if yeah, it so buddy. happens that you forget to where to go, go over to darkwindowspod.com. Yeah, that's our website. Do what? Do what? What do you do uh, over there? You do website things? Uh, you do? If you If you really want, like you can find links to studio there. You can find links to all of our social media, our Facebook, Instagram, our Twitter by proxy of Instagram. Because <laughs> that's the only way I post to Twitter is through Instagram. Um, oh, on Twitter. And you can also <clears throat> find a link to our Age of Radio page, which is the network that we are part of. You can go over and find your next favorite podcast at mm-hmm. Age of Radio. If you want some true crime like what we just covered, obviously we do true crime. There's people out there on the network that do it way better than us. Obviously, yeah. I mean, I'm not. It, and, it, and it's uh, and it varies too. You know, yeah, on what they cover, all kinds of stuff. Um, you want somebody talking about some history and maybe some gangsters and shit? We got a buddy that does that. We've got a couple, two, three different movie pod, uh, movie podcasts. Uh, there's financial stuff. There's some motivational stuff. There's sports if you're into sports. I mean, we're watching baseball as we record. So, yeah, um. I mean, my brother <laughs> uh, does uh, does a podcast out of uh, Portland, Oregon. It's uh, Diamonds and Roses podcast, which is basically about uh, you know the Northwest sports, um, baseball in general. And uh, yeah, you should go check that hit him out if you want to. Yeah, pretty good little podcast over there. Um, yeah, you can also hell if you want to know learn how to make beer. We got a yeah, we uh, got a we got a homebrew show over there too. Yeah, and but or if you or if you're not even into any of that, if you you want to uh, get some kind of inspirational help type of thing, you know, some something like that, we have that as well. And we've got a, uh, we've got a, a couple of shows over there that uh, Joey Galvez does talking about comic books, yeah. which I mean, comic books are pretty fucking cool. I never really got into them that much, but no. I like the movies. So Yeah, I never really got into comic books. Cause I we didn't never have had comic a, books as a kid. We didn't have a comic book shop. No, we live out in butt fuck nowhere. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Anyway, with that being said, we will be back next week with a to be determined topic yes. as usual because as we don't usual. do any preparation. We just decide on something and then dive balls first into researching it. <laughs> exactly. But until then, if you want to see what we do next week, probably something dumb. Come back and join us. But until then, just because you can't see out into the dark doesn't mean that the dark can't see into you. Thank <laughs> you.